First, I want to talk about some tools that we all use. We use them every day. We don't think about it. We're always using tools. Like, for instance, when you got up this morning, did you take a shower? Shower's the first thing that I thought of as a tool because without it, we would be taking baths in the cold lake. And <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, did, you, <laughs> did you fix yourself some breakfast? Maybe uh, cook some eggs on the stove. Well, stove's a tool that we, we use every day so we're not cooking our meals over an open flame. Or, uh, I should say, a campfire, because some people do cook over an open flame. <laughs> anyway, do you use your, did you look at your cell phone today? Did you check your email? Did you check your um, social media? These are all tools that we use to keep connected to one another. And I would bet that most of you got here today by car. Cars are a great invention that we used that was made so that we could get from point A to point B much more conveniently. I have friends who would still be on the road to get here today with weren't for a car. My name is Janice Ghosh and I'm a retired social worker. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in social work. Um, during my time as a, a licensed clinical social worker, I worked in both psychiatric hospitals and hospitals. I ended my career working at Kaiser Permanente, which is a health maintenance organization. I worked in one of their clinics as one of their therapists in, a, in the Department of Psychiatry. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, nearly, also known as MS, nearly 30 years ago. Um, what happened is I started having symptoms of MS that exhibited in um, forgetfulness, um, fatigue, uh, I would forget words, uh, any kind of cognition problems. And you just don't inspire confidence when you're talking to a client and you forget what you're talking about. So I decided it was time to leave. And I just want you to know that I did not leave because I sit in a wheelchair. Although medical settings is one of the, are one of the hardest places, I think, to work if you're sitting in a wheelchair. They're not convenient. But they're also, it's also not an excuse to not go to work. MS is a neurological disorder that is different for everyone who is diagnosed with it. Um, from exhibiting no, no symptoms at all to extreme symptoms. I happen to be a person who falls in the middle. When I was first diagnosed, I used a cane because I had a tendency to fall. And after several years, I had a fall and I broke my ankle. And after that, after I healed, I decided it was time to progress onto forearm crutches. Now, forearm crutches, are, they're also called Canadian crutches, and they're the ones that kind of clip to the front of your arm. Um, and I used those for several years. But I also used a manual wheelchair and a scooter if I was going any distance at all, because I um, needed to conserve my energy, because walking took up a lot of energy. Um, in fact, that's what I called them, was my energy conservation devices. <laughs> so it is... It, it is important to know that people with MS are not always, uh, don't always need such visible tools. But if you need those tools, it's not a failure to use them, no matter what the actors and actresses say who have MS. It's not a failure. The nature of MS for me is I never know what I'm going to get on any given day. And one day, I woke up in the morning and my legs would no longer support me for more than a step or two. And this kind of thing had happened to me in the past, um, but it only lasted for like a day and maybe up to a month for the longest. This time it's been several months and it's going on to a year now. Thank goodness I already had the wheelchair. <laughs> you know, I had the tools available to me now. Between that and I have a really very supportive husband and they're both kind of tools. <laughs> <laughs> this chair. This chair provides me with the independence I need to live a normal life. I've actually had people tell me that their life would be over if they had to sit in a wheelchair. If they were confined to a wheelchair, it would be done. They wouldn't want to live. One, really? And two, whoever came up with that term confined to a wheelchair? Because what this wheelchair does for me is it, it, it gives me independence. Without it, I would be confined to my house. I'd be confined to my home, my bedroom, even my bed. And so what this gives me is an option to get out of that environment. And 
I have options now, whether I choose to leave my house or not, because it, sometimes it's very difficult to maneuver these things in, even in my house, or when I go out in public, it can be very frustrating, but at least I have the choice. Without it, I have no choices. And I'm personally okay with using whatever tools it takes to make my life easier. I use a mop to wash my floors instead of doing it on my hands and knees. My mother would cringe if she heard me say that, but I do. And I use an electric mixer <laughs> instead of um, mixing cookie dough by hand. It's just easier. So I'm also okay with using a wheelchair instead of my legs if I need to. When I first started using the wheelchair, like I said, it was to conserve my energy. And I was in graduate school at the time and I was studying social work and I was getting exhausted walking from one end of the campus to the other. It was just too much and you know, looking at all the books and all of that, because in those days we used books. And, uh, but I actually had some, some peers. These are other people who are studying social work. Supposedly these empathetic people come up and approach me and tell me that they thought maybe I should quit or had I thought about quitting school because it was going to end up being too much for me. My husband says it was because of the grade curve, but I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I told him I didn't quit. I wasn't going to quit. And I said, the reason I don't quit is because I think with my head. I don't think with my butt. <laughs> and so then I thought later, I said, you know, I was thinking back and I was, cause I was kind of offended, you know? <laughs> so I thought about it later and I said, you know, have these people never heard of Stephen Hawking? <laughs> I mean, really. So now I think about it and I say, don't shut me down if I'm sitting down. Just because I'm sitting down doesn't mean I can't think. So in doing research for, in doing research for this talk, I ran across several articles on how to interact with people who, um, are in, who are in wheelchairs. And one of my favorite lines was from a, a blogger who calls herself Patient C. And she said something to the effect of that we are all people in chairs. My, my chair here is just a little bit different than all the chairs that you are sitting in right now. But we're all people in chairs. I must say that since I've moved from the San Francisco Bay Area to the Sierra Foothills two years ago, I find that I am treated overall more as a person than as an obstacle. And that's sad to say, but it's also um, did more difficult here because I live in a historic town. And historic towns, it's 100 years old, and ADA wasn't really in effect then. So it is a little bit more difficult to get around, as you can see. But here what I've noticed is that people don't rush to get to the door in front of me to get through the door before me. And yes, that does ha it does happen a lot, you know, in, in the cities or the Bay Area. What they do now is that they don't seem to be in such a hurry. People will go ahead of me and say, can I get the door for you? And you know, for me, courtesy goes a long way. That could be my age, but I think it's just a nice thing. Also, when you talk to me, Remember, I'm not a three-year-old. <laughs> and use that little six on voice is just not necessary. And it's really, really irritating. <laughs> so I would really appreciate it if you would treat me like the grown-up that I am. <laughs> or worse yet, pretend I'm not even there, that I don't exist. I recently, my daughter and I went to get a pedicure, and this is a thing that we do frequently, and we've been going to the same place for a couple years. And I was in my chair, and the woman looks at my daughter and says, what happened to her? And I'm thinking, really? Sitting right here. You could ask me. You know, you're polite in the answer, but it, it, it just makes you feel invisible. And you know, that hasn't changed in years. When my daughters were both teenagers, they would, um, we'd go shopping, and the clerks would always talk to them. I mean, I know they were cuter, but most of the time it got to be annoying, and I said, finally, I said, you know, I'm the one paying for this stuff. If you want to talk about the purchase, you really kind of need to talk to me. And it was kind of a life lesson for them, and I kind of got to let up some steam. <laughs> but when, the one time that, when I'm not invisible when we're shopping is, when I try to get through the, all those little aisles between racks, and my daughters would take the racks and just go, 
and move them. And boy, the clerks were honest like that. You know, they didn't want any part of us moving stuff. You know, I guess it was a liability or something. But we always did, and we always moved them back, and we reassured them that we would. Now, with this feeling of invisibility, this is one of my favorites, is I love to go to amusement parks. I love riding roller coasters, and I will ride just about anything you dare me to. Pretty much. And um, maneuvering around in, a, in that kind of a setting is really difficult because everybody's kind of got their own agenda. And I finally realized their agenda was not to irritate me. Their agenda was to have a good time. You know, and everybody's in their own little group and they want to have fun, you know, and, and they're talking to each other and they're just not paying attention to where they're going. And the best example of this is, is when my youngest daughter was a teenager and we'd gone to Disneyland. And these girls, it was nighttime, there were some girls and they were just giggling and laughing and they're running, and I mean, we're talking running through the park. And this one girl tripped and she fell on my lap. And she's literally sitting on my lap. And I don't know if it was because I was in my manual chair, which kind of rolls, I mean, this kind of stays stationary, but that one was rolling. She couldn't get up. And so she's giggling and she's going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, she's giggling. And so my daughter plants herself right in front of my chair, grabs the girl, pulls her up, and she looks at her and goes, how would you like it if I did that to your mom? <laughs> really put kind of things in perspective. It, it was, you know, for me, it, it taught me a lot about my daughter <laughs> and how protective she is. <laughs> but it also, I kind of thought, you know, maybe this, this girl learned a lesson and maybe she'll slow down a little bit. And who knows, you know, she did in front of us, but she was a teenager, <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> Anyway, that segues to, a, to another Disneyland story. Several years later, my oldest granddaughter, we had taken her to Disneyland, and she was getting frustrated with everybody bumping into us and stopping right in front of us or whatever. And I explained to her about everybody just wants to have fun. But then I also explained that um, I had come to the realization that if you're in a wheelchair, you have on an invisibility cloak, and people just don't see you. And while they're all involved with their own things, they just don't see us, although we can see them. And what it did is it, it allowed us to have fun with it. Instead of being frustrated by it, we can make fun and have fun with it. So I really want to thank J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter for coming up with the idea of an invisibility cloak. <laughs> and I must say that I think that's one of my favorite tools. When I was still working, I did a support group for people who had disabilities and people who were getting older. And, you know, of course, across the whole groups, they had a multitude of different diagnoses, but um, one thing that they had in common was change, and they were having difficult with changes in their lives, because this is not where we really wanted to be. This, was, this wasn't the plan, no. And so, no one ever wants to admit that they need help. And heaven forbid, ask for help. No one wants to ask for help. And I found this was kind of consistent across the board. And then I was faced with it. My husband had had a knee injury and he had to have several surgeries on his knees. And um, during one of the surgeries, his best friend came from Truckee all the way down to the Bay Area and stayed with us for a week or so to drive me around to take him to appointments and get everything, transfer him and do what needed to be done. And then a couple years later, he had his, his knee replaced. And that was kind of scary because now he's in the hospital and it's all, you know, he can't move, I can't move him. And we had friends come, and they stayed in, in, at the hospital with me, and they got him home. They transferred him to the, the, the car, and they transferred him to the house. And these were all things that I couldn't have possibly done. I could drive it, but I certainly couldn't move him. And then I thought, okay, now we're home, now what? And thank goodness for my niece. <laughs> she was on spring break, and she came and she stayed with us until he was able to move himself a little bit. And I am eternally grateful for all the help we got. But what it did is it also opened my eyes that things are not going to get easier, they're going to get a little bit harder. And so that's when we made the decision to move here to the Sierra Foothills to be closer to my daughter and her family. So we could get all the help. Now we have all the help we could possibly want. <laughs> and we moved, and not yet, no. and we moved to a 10-acre ranch, complete with two steer, a dozen chickens, a horse, a quarter acre garden. And we just, and it seems kind of strange that we would do this for a woman in a wheelchair and a man with bad knees. But who could resist? So.
so we're very happy that we're here. We did have to make some adaptations to the house and to the and to, so that I could work in the garden and so that I could move around in my house. But we make it work. One of the don'ts that I read about several of the articles is to tell a person in a chair or using crutches or you know, a walker or a cave is that they look too good to be using that. I read one article where it was a young woman who was writing the article and she said she was tired of telling people she was too pretty to have to be in a wheelchair. What a thing to say to somebody, you know? She says, tell my spine that, you know? <laughs> so, but anyway, for me, what happened to me was that we were at AT&T Park. We went to go see a Giants game. And we were, the kids wanted to go run around the bases. That's something they let them do after. We're walking down to the, the field. And I'm on my farm crutches. Big mistake. This man, the security guard, looks at me and he says, next time you're here, I don't want to see you on those crutches. So I just smiled and kind of nodded. <laughs> and after we got by him, I looked at my daughter and I said, uh, he wouldn't see me on him again. I'll be in my chair. What was I thinking trying to walk this far? That was nuts. But it's important to realize that people who are using these devices aren't using them for fun or for sport. They're using them to be mobile. So I can go to a Giants game. So I can go out to my yard. So I can do the things I want to do. Which brings me to the next thing. Please don't tell me I'm an inspiration. Really, for what? For getting up, for getting dressed, for going out of the house. You know, I'm not doing anything different than any of you are doing. Now, anyone can be an inspiration. I just don't want to be an inspiration because I'm sitting in a wheelchair. I had a, a woman once at this little boutique who came up and said, and I'm going to do it again, you are so lucky to get out. It's so important that you get out and you're healthy and it keeps you going and just keep it up. So I looked at her and I said, you mean beyond the 40 hours I worked this week? And she, she kind of went, ooh. Her, her, the look on her face was priceless. <laughs> but the sad thing is, is that the assumption was that since I was sitting in a wheelchair, I couldn't possibly have a job. Being confined to a wheelchair is a misnomer. The wheelchair provides independence, not dependence. They're an extension of who we are in our personal space. So be aware of that. I mean, I'm not the size of a person here. I've got a lot more going on. And the best example I can come up with that is at Christmas time, we were, I was at my nephew's house, and it was really crowded. And so I kind of found my niche, my spot, like so I could see everything that was going on, and people could still talk to me, but I found my spot. And it was fine until people decided that they could come up behind me and start, I was in my manual chair, so there's handles with that. So I was getting sick. Finally, I said, you guys got to stop it. I'm getting sick. And my husband was like, doing it too. It was like, you did it too. And I'm like, he should know better. But so finally, I, I got to thinking about who goes up behind somebody on their shoulders and starts going like this. You know, make them sick. But so that's kind of what I'm trying to say is you got to be aware that this is all part of my personal space. Also, if you see a person in a wheelchair, just don't come up behind them and start pushing them. It's really disconcerting and really, it can be very disorienting, especially if they move fast and you don't know what they're doing. But if you do see somebody in a wheelchair and they look like they need assistance, ask them. You know, use your words. It's not a problem. Ask them. And if they want help, they'll say yes, and if they don't, they'll say no. I used to say no all the time just because I had to prove I could do it. But now I know I can do whatever I want to do for the most part, and if I need assistance, I will take assistance. I'll take the help. If I'm having a bad day, why make it worse? Along those lines, if you are pushing somebody in a wheelchair and it's crowded, be aware of where you're at. I, rem I love, this is one of my favorite things to do, is I love reminding my family and friends of when we're in a crowd, the level of where my head is to the person in the crowd in front of me. <laughs> I mean really, people. Do you want your nose that close to somebody's butt? 
I know. What I'm trying to get across again is to use your words. Don't get into personal space, which happens to be a larger area. And it's even larger if you happen to have a surf stone. And I say this because I'm thinking about it a lot because I've been on a waiting list for nearly two years for a service dog, but you used to have me here and a dog there, boy, I've just doubled my size. So, because the dogs are a tool. They're there to make life more convenient and more, so provide more independence. Also, if a person chair, if I was to transfer from this chair to this chair, don't move this one away. Or if you're walking with crutches and you set them down and you sit in the chair, don't move the crutches away. And the reason for that is because you've now taken my mobility away. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to ask permission to go to the bathroom. I want to just get up and go. So, for the most part, don't be a tool. Let me use my tools. <laughs> don't assume that a person who, you, who looks good doesn't need their tools. And the best example I could come up with this is the handicapped placards or handicapped parking because they're not just for people in wheelchairs. There's a myriad of reasons a person could have, have a handicap placard. And, excuse me, they could have a breathing problem, they could have a heart problem, they could have a stamina problem, we don't know. And as long, if they have the placard, it's really none of our business and it's not for us to question. I've been asked, do you really need that? Obviously, when I was using the crutches, not the chair. So, to sum it up, wheelchairs were not invented for confinement. They were invented to provide independence and increase mobility. Everyone uses tools. A wheelchair just happens to be one of mine. I love my life. I love my, my husband, my family, and my friends. Don't feel sorry for me. I'm okay sitting or standing. Thank you.